Good morning. Welcome to the NASPA 4 East New Professionals and Graduate Students Knowledge Community. It's our first master class of the year, and we are very excited to be here um, with you today. Our topic today is a discussion around is student affairs um, for me? You know, a lot of folks um, who are part of the knowledge community who are new professionals and our graduate students want to know how can they continue to be successful in the career when they get there, as well as um, how to support them once they move on after their first or second year. We know one of the ways our knowledge community wants to continue to support all the members is to provide programs like this in hopes that um, more of you will stay in the profession um, and progress through their um, through their career. We have a couple of different um, master classes lined up for this year. One of them in September is really all going to be about the career path and how you can explore different options um, within your career path. Um, but today's topic is about is student affairs for me. Um, I am Dr. Gina Lee Olakoya. I serve as the master class coordinator for this particular knowledge community. And as I said before, I am delighted um, to be here to be able to, to get this going. Again, appreciate everyone um, in our technology. This is we're all using some new technology today, so hang in there with us if we have some perks along the way. Um, but if you would like to hang in there with us, we would appreciate it. Um, just to give you some updates about some things that are happening within our knowledge community. As I mentioned, in December, we'll be doing another master class, which is all around the focus of exploring your career path and your journey in this field, which will include some topics around navigating your career, um, the politics, um, determining mentors and gaining mentors and help support your career. Um, and then for those of you who are going to be joining us in um, Detroit at the regional conference, we have a knowledge community social, which will be on November 13th at 6 p.m. at the Hard Rock Cafe. So hopefully you'll have a chance to uh, meet up with some other members of the knowledge community, those who you might just see virtually. Now you'll be able to get them, meet them and face-to-face -face live at the Hard Rock Cafe. So we're pretty excited about that. So today our panel um, includes, includes a couple of professionals um, who have varying degrees of expertise, and they will be able to share with you a little bit more. Um, but today we have with us Dr. Gigi Sakubin, who serves as a member of the Student Affairs Senior Leadership Team at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, reporting directly to the Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs. As the Associate Vice Chancellor and Director of the Office of Inclusion and Intercultural Relations, Gigi provides administrative oversight for the Asian American Cultural Center, the Bruce Nesmith African American Cultural Center, diversity and social education programs, the Women's Resource Center, the LGBT uh, Resource Center, the La Casa Cultural Latina Center, and their international education programs. She previously served in positions at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville in Enrollment Services, the College of Education and Health Professions, Student Affairs, as well as the College of Engineering before arriving at Illinois. Dr. Sir Cuban brings a wide range of experience in multicultural programs, international education, first year experience, recruitment, and retention. Her background includes a history of collaboration with academic affairs in developing recruitment and retention programs in the College of Engineering and Education at Arkansas. Gigi has also been an active member of NASPA, where she has presented at numerous national and regional conferences. She has also served as the AVP mm -hmm. Steering Committee and currently is a faculty member for the AVP Institute, a part of NASPA. She has a passion for working with students and student programs. She enjoys supporting the academic personal development of students as well as promoting diversity and inclusion. Dr. Sakuban holds a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's degree in health science, and a doctorate in higher education administration all from the University of Arkansas. Our second speaker today is, is Anne-Marie Morgan, who currently serves um, as Assistant Dean of Students at the University of Illinois. Anne-Marie um, has worked at North Dakota State, Texas A&M University, Loyola University Chicago, and currently now here at the University of Illinois. She has worked in areas of student affairs that include Greek life, student activities, conduct and student advocacy. Anne-Marie has been involved in developing leadership initiatives, mission-centered experiences, professional development activities, and student recognition programs. 
Anne-Marie has a bachelor's degree in psychology from Bradley, a master's degree in college student personnel from Bowling Green State University, and she also has a master's degree in pastoral studies from Loyola University. And finally, Jessica Newman is a proud alum of the University of Illinois Champaign, where she received her bachelor's in global studies, and Illinois State University, where she received a master's in education and college student personnel administration. She currently sp spreads her black girl magic in the central <laughs> coast of California as a coordinator of cross cultural center, as a coordinator of the cross cultural center at Cal State Monterey Bay. She is an educator and administrator of social justice education. Her passion for creating inclusion environments for under un underserved and underrepresented students on college campuses is what drove her to higher education. She aims to create social and systemic change within higher education, aspiring to work and attain a doctorate in educational policies at some point. And Jessica will follow up more with that as well. <laughs> so everyone, welcome to our panel. Um, to get us started, what I've asked each of the panels to do is to give consideration to a few questions. And the first question we will go ahead and start with is for each of you to discuss your current roles and what has led you to your position. Let's start with Anne-Marie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess All right, I'm going to get us started. I'm getting a little bit of an echo here, so I apologize if I'm a little stilted. And uh, I can't figure out at the moment how to unpair my headset, so I will be your time life operator for, <laughs> for today. Um, so my current role, um, as uh, Dr. Lee Olokoya shared, is uh, I am an assistant dean of students at the University of Illinois um, here in Urbana-Champaign in the Student Assistant Center, which is a unit within the office of the dean of students. Um, overall, our um, office helps assist in connecting students to the various resources available to them here at the University of Illinois. Um, as folks may know, the University of Illinois is a pretty large campus with an excess of 40,000 students um, and it's a pretty decentralized campus which means it can be kind of difficult to navigate especially for incoming students and so our office does a lot of connecting students to the resources and support um, available to them um, we also like to say that we worked with both we work with both distressed and distressing students um, and so whether it's a student who's experiencing a certain level of, a, of distress and finds their way to us or to um, um, another faculty staff member who then uh, calls us, or um, a student who is causing distress um, or disruptions among others, um, and our office then consults with um, faculty and staff as appropriate. Um, this was an intentional decision to take this job at this particular location. Um, from my bio, I've kind of been um, way far north, way far south, and then kind of back to the middle, um, and found my way um, here to the U University of Illinois in part because it was time to get closer to family um, and so made a values-based decision to leave my position at Loyola University Chicago and get closer to home um, and this particular position piqued my interest in terms of um, number one the uncertainty of what could happen on any given day um, although that doesn't um, really uh, differentiate this position from many in student affairs um, but given just sort of uh, the level of distress that many of our students are experiencing and being able to engage in students on a one-on-one -on -one basis and work with faculty and staff on how best to serve students who are having a difficult time were all things that were attractive to me in terms of taking this particular position. So um, that's what I'm doing and uh, some reasons for why I'm doing it. Thanks, Anne-Marie. How about we move on to Jessica? Yes, so I am at Cal State University Monterey Bay. I am the coordinator for the Autocross Cultural Center. Um, coming into this position after graduate school, um, I went. I followed right after graduate school coming into this position, and I was very intentional on wanting to be in um, a diversity center. Um, I did my internship at the University of California Riverside um, as a graduate assistant for the LGBT Resource Center and Housing. Um, so throughout my years of undergrad, doing student activism and having a passion, having a passion for seeing. Um, students of color on campus, increasing that number, getting in touch um, and having that support 
um, system for students of color on campus was very important to me as a student activist. And that translated into my graduate school um, work. And then now it's just driving, that passion is continuously driving me and what I want to do. Um, so I was thinking about people like Gina and Gigi, they supported me through um, my undergraduate experience and I wanted to become them. <laughs> so um, that drove my passion and that's why I do the work that I do now. Um, thinking about my being a first year um, undergraduate student at the University of Illinois, which is a predominantly white space. My question was always, where are the black students? So <laughs> that question stays with me um, as I go into my work in trying to not only see where all the black students are, but bring those intersectional forces together so um, students of color can have a safe space to be on campus and they can feel supported and navigate um, their collegiate experience successfully. Um, so that's why I do the work that I do. Well, I'm here. Thank you, Jessica. <clears throat> and then Dr. Sakuban. Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, as uh, Dr. Leo Lacoyle mentioned, I'm at the University of Illinois now. I've been in higher ed for 20 years, so it hasn't really felt like it's been that long. So most of my work has been academic and student affairs. And so my work now does exactly what Jessica talks about, is providing safe spaces on campus and helping um, underrepresented students navigate the college experience. And so I do that through all of my different centers. I have eight different units that report directly to, to me, and those include the areas that she mentioned. And so all of those areas have directors that have staff and really work um, really well together to provide these transformative experience for students on campus. So my journey prior to coming to Arkansas involved working, I started out in admissions and then worked um, in the College of Education in recruitment and scholarships as well as working with some student um, ambassadors. Then I moved on to become the director of the Multicultural Center at Arkansas and then on to a retention program for first year students in the College of Engineering where I simultaneously worked on my doctorate while working full time as well. And so after that, it was time to move out of Arkansas and find something else. And so I'm here at Illinois. Thank you. <clears throat> We can talk a little bit about um, your own professional journey. If you could elaborate a little bit on <clears throat> how you ended up in the different places that you ended up and why. So why you would have selected some of the positions, what were the things that you were looking for in those positions. How did you end up in each of the places that you ultimately um, called your professional home for a period of time that, that you were there? So our newest person, Jessica, would be a good person to start with. <laughs> Jessica. Um, so being, my thought process of being or coming to uh, Cal State University Monterey Bay was my first um, experience with the University of California Riverside. Um, they have a dynamic um, cross-cultural center, and they also have cultural and identity-based centers. Um, so at my internship, we were able to um, get to know the work behind those centers, but also visit other centers around California and cross-cultural centers, um, which is, I would say, the um, the same as multicultural centers on the East Coast um, is a big thing out here. So I'm like, oh, how can I tap into this work? So I started getting connected to different folks out here. And then once it was time for my job search, um, California was, I was pulling back for California too. <laughs> um, so, and I'm very explorative. So, so that was something big for me. Like, how can I use this opportunity uh, for my personal self to adventure um, outside of Illinois? Cause I spent most of my time in Illinois. Um, but also doing the stuff that I love to do and having that, um, being, uh, keeping my passion and focus. Um, so being at the California, at the Cross Cultural Center here at Cal State Monterey Bay, I was a one, um, person show. So it was just me over this one Cross Cultural Center for 7,500 students. Um, and I think that was something I can get into that later, but as far as like the expectations and the things and how, um, and how everything has rolled out um, it's been, and it's been a very different um, reality. So understanding, um, 
I was excited about that growth. I was excited about tapping into a position that was um, that will help me develop an office because my specific position was in field for three years. Um, so I was able to grow um, a lot of structures and bring new programs and thoughts and ideas and get innovative with the work that I was doing. Um, so drove me so like the creativity the california um and just the excitement after grad school because everybody wants a job but you also want to think about your holistic self too so thank you jessica Gigi. okay so i would say you know when i first started out in higher ed i really didn't know that I wanted a career in higher education until I applied for my first job. And so I was in a master's program at the time in health science, community health, and I interviewed for a job in the admissions office as a recruiter. And I've always told students that, you know, you're trying to find your first job in higher ed, it's always good to start in those ones that can really give you a broad breadth of what the university has to offer. So, you know, being a recruiter or being an academic advisor, you have to learn a little bit about everybody and what everybody does. And so, that was a great first position that I held, got to travel around the country and around the state of Arkansas meeting with high school students and counselors. And I, when I had interviewed for the job initially, the advisor who was, on, who was the chair of the search committee said, had you ever considered her a career in higher ed? And I told her I didn't know you could work on campus. And so once I started that job, it really started my love of working with students. And so that's kind of like Jessica, that's where I found my passion. And so every job since then, I always made sure that the next job had pieces of the job that I was doing before, plus something new about it. And so I've kind of followed that path throughout my career. And the other part was that I wanted to make sure that I constantly had interaction with students. And so as many of you know, as you start to move up the career ladder, you know, you get less and less um, interaction with students, but you just have to, you know, be more conscious about how you make those interactions. And so that's been really important for me as well to be able to create those experiences. And early in my career, I really initially wanted to be a president of a university. And then um, once I got here to Illinois in my position now, I work a lot with the chancellor's office and the provost. And I realized very quickly that I want to just be a vice chancellor for student affairs. And that's as high as I want to go. So you know, that's where you can really, I feel like I can really make a positive difference in the lives of students because we directly impact the student experience on campus. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anne-Marie? Yes, all right. Um, so um, I would say I came to student affairs similar to um, how many students may do that. Um, I certainly was a pretty involved undergraduate student, um, orientation leader, I was in a sorority, I was in RA, I was in student government, um, all those kinds of fun things. Um, and at some point during that, um, <clears throat> learned that I could essentially be an orientation leader for life. Um, <laughs> I uh, had been uh, unsure about my major and ended up uh, selecting psychology with the thought that I would go into family um, and marriage counseling. Um, and then a friend of mine, a fellow orientation leader, was applying for graduate schools um, in higher ed, and I asked her more about that. And she had um, gotten some materials from Bowling Green State University in Ohio, um, but she was from Florida and decided that it was too far north for her to go to graduate school there. Um, and so I asked if she'd be willing to share her materials with me. Um, and so I found my way from Bradley University to Bowling Green State, um, where I was a fraternity house director for two years. Um, and it was an education, as I like to say. Um, and it had a great experience with the Greek life, the fraternity sorority um, folks there um, in Bowling Green and decided that from there, um, I wanted to continue along that kind of work. Um, I never really had sort of an end goal in mind, um, never really had a thought about, I wanna be a vice president, um, certainly not a president, Gigi, you're <laughs> fabulous for even considering that. Um, but I appreciate the decision um, now knowing more, perhaps maybe not. <laughs> Um, but I went ahead um, and continued down the path of, you know what, um, this fraternity sorority thing is something that I enjoy, and so I'm going to continue doing that. Um, so I was at North Dakota State University for two years and worked with the community there. Um, and while there, also was able to take on responsibility for the, um, super, the 
selection, supervision, and training of the orientation leaders. Um, and through that experience, realized that my true love lied uh, with orientation. Um, and so left North Dakota after two years and actually went back home for about six months and did some temp work while I looked for jobs in the Midwest, um, which really didn't happen for me because I ended up in College Station, Texas, um, working with a little program known as Fish Camp. So uh, for anyone who may not be familiar with uh, the program known as Fish Camp, it is a voluntary student-run orientation type program where students, incoming students, essentially um, spend a couple of days in the east woods of Texas um, with upper class students learning what it means to be an Aggie, learning about um, the traditions, getting to know other students, um, and uh, playing some also um, in the east woods of Texas. And so I worked with that program. Um, there were about a thousand undergrad, there are about a thousand undergraduate students who are involved in making that program happen um, and I was the advisor to that group. Um, also worked while I was there with some leadership initiatives, helped to redesign a leadership class, um, got involved in some student organization uh, discipline, uh, conduct kind of work, uh, and also did some professional development work for the division. And so um, after two and a half years there, um, which really were uh, wonderful years, uh, some students who are still in my life today um, as a result of being down at a and um, decided that it really was indeed time to get back to the Midwest and had a moment of realizing that um, given the importance that my own personal faith um, has played in my life that I wanted to give Catholic higher education a try um, and ended up going from Texas A&M to um, Loyola University Chicago which is a Jesuit Catholic institution um, and served in the roles of student uh, director of student activities for four or for two years the director of conduct for four um, and then the next um, eight years uh, associate Dean of Students at our Water Tower campus just off Michigan Avenue. Um, and so dealt with a lot of different things over the course of my time there. Um, certainly while at uh, while at Loyola began to think about whether I wanted to jump out of student affairs and potentially move into ministry, hence my degree in pastoral studies, um, but realized that, um, nope, I was a student affairs kid, and so I was going to stick around um, and do that, but had the opportunity to get involved in other larger mission kinds of institutions so um, or experiences and so I kind of straddled the student affairs and mission and ministry line um, and for part of my time at Loyola supervised the ministry operation at the Water Tower campus um, and got my got my ministry fix there um, and so worked on a lot of different things for those of you who may be at campuses that talk about we want to start new traditions which is always a fun conversation to have um, was involved in, in creating some new campus-wide initiatives um, that kind of paired with our four-year plan for what it meant to be at Loyola for four years um, and had a great great experience and some great opportunities to get my hands in a lot of different things across campus. Um, then as I alluded to earlier decided that um, after 14 years at Loyola, which really is the longest that I've been anywhere, including my childhood home, um, it was time to get a little bit closer to family and be more of a daily presence um, with my family. And so uh, moved down here to Illinois and um, did a lot of soul searching. Uh, I would say I did that job search for over the course of about four or five years. I was flirting with the idea of leaving Loyola. Um, alluding to a question maybe down the line considered leaving the field um, and applied for some jobs outside of the field, um, really considered what kind of a role did I feel that I could really contribute to, um, and so passed up some possible opportunities um, because I didn't really think I'd be happy doing it, and then uh, found this position here in the Student Assistance Center at Illinois, which has been um, certainly professional, professionally, um, it's allowed for some growth um, after many, many years in the field um, and really is something that um, I think was a good fit. So that's the path here. Thank you. <clears throat> so one of the things that um, we all talk a little bit about is in our first jobs, we have an idea of what that first job is going to be. Um, you know, we bring our box of stuff to our office and we're really ex excited about it. Um, 
one of the things I would like to ask you all is to give thought to that first position um, that you had in student affairs and talk a little bit about the expectations that you went into that position with and were those expectations met and how did you process your 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 first year in, in um, alignment with those expectations that you brought with you into your first job Anne-Marie sure um, and excuse me for a moment I'm getting a little instant message um, I've got to let folks know that uh, I'm not available at the moment. Um, so, um, so yeah, I laugh. Um, so uh, one of the things that was drilled into my head as a as a graduate student was call your supervisor, call your supervisor, call your supervisor. Um, and so I was really great um, at notifying my supervisor as um, different things came up and, and working with them and engaging in how best to address the situation. And I remember, um, <clears throat> In the first week or two of my position, meeting with a representative from one of the sororities, um, uh, the national representative who had come to campus, um, and you know we kind of did our meet and greet. And as she was getting ready to walk out the door, she informed me, um, "Hey, I just want to let you know um, that one of the fraternities on campus for one of their recruitment events is planning a pudding wrestling event um, with members of the sororities um, as contestants." Um, good luck. Bye bye. Um, and I sort of, there was no, while I certainly had a supervisor, um, it wasn't a matter of I need to call my supervisor and get them on this. Um, I was now the person to do it. Um, so I think sort of that being thrown out of the nest, as it were, um, and being sort of, hey, this is me now. So let me think about um, what this means, how I'm going to manage this, um, who I need to, to kind of bring into the loop. Um, you know, I will say, um, you know, sort of having um, having those folks that, that you know that you can talk to and speak with um, is a really great, um, really great thing in graduate school. And when you get to a new place, um, you don't necessarily have those folks um, from day one. Um, and certainly, you know, I think developing some relationships right off the get go, um, you know, getting to know the folks that you work with, um, developing those relationships, getting to know uh, the people who for the weeks and months and years to come, you will be knocking on their door to sort of do some brainstorming and um, some collaborating is certainly important. Um, but I do remember just in those first weeks, um, you know, sort of being hit with my first challenge and thinking, yikes, this is me now, what do I do? Um, and am I to throw my body between them and the pudding or are there other ways that I can manage this particular um, situation um, and luckily was able to, to kind of work my way through it. So um, I'm not sure if that gets totally to what we're after, but that is what I remember as one of my first professional moments. Thanks, Annie. The pudding, I'm going to have to remember that. <laughs> yeah, and the best, though, and this is the, this is the, sort of the PS to that story. Um, I then had formal dinner with the chapter um, about a month or so later, and pudding was the dessert. So uh. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> oh, that's, funny. <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. <laughs> um, Gigi, how about you? Okay, so I would say I had a number of stories to share too, but I think in that first year, just drilling it down to that first job, um, I had a really good boss at the time and she was really supportive of the work that we were doing. And for me, I, I always had high expectations of myself and like Anne-Marie, I was an orientation leader, I was an RA as an undergrad, I was in a sorority and did a whole bunch of other um, student activities types of things when I was an undergrad. And so it was easy to be a recruiter for my alma mater because I could go out and talk about those experiences. And so my expectations really, I wanted just to be the best version of myself and, you know, wherever that was going to lead me, I wasn't really sure, but I just wanted to be a resource to the people that I worked with. And um, I do remember at the time um, my sorority was starting a graduate chapter in the area. And so I actually became the grad advisor for the sorority. And um, during one piece of that um, time, they had gotten involved in some hazing activities um, on campus or really off campus. And um, as the graduate advisor, me and a few other of the grad sores who were on the um, 
graduate advisory committee actually busted up the um, illegal hazing activity off campus. <laughs> and so um, it was really interesting because, you know, they wanted to say it was just a party, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, give it a couple of days later, um, those, there were a few from that group that had gotten busted who actually decided they wanted to come visit me at my job and talk about how disappointed they were in the fact that we were all involved in breaking up their experiences, all those kind of things. So that was interesting because at one point I just said, you know, you all will just need to leave. We'll have to discuss this at another time. And they were yelling at the top of their lungs out in the lobby. This was at my job. And so there was one point in my head I thought, oh gosh, am I going to have to call the police? Because no one had come out to say, do you guys need any help? Do you, does anybody need assistance? Anything like that. So it actually, you know, I was able to, you know, calm them down and they eventually left. But that was kind of one of those times where your work and your kind of mentorship with students kind of goes to the other side where it can be, um, you know, conflict driven. So <laughs> that was, that was really interesting. So I had to kind of talk about my boss with that particular experience and how I would kind of balance that role as a sorority advisor with my first job. So that was not quite the pudding story, Anne-Marie, but um, I probably at that point wanted to throw some pudding or something <laughs> that, after that experience. Thank you. <clears throat> I think for Jessica, who is um, our newest professional, <laughs> talk a little bit about that, um, those expectations. Yes. Um, so expecting, coming in, I was expecting um, to be like nurtured in my innovation, uh, so, like supported in that and um, also like having that support, especially as a black woman, um, a new professional as a black woman as well, um, trying, to identi trying to navigate that support system. Um, and higher education could be hard. Um, so I was hoping that I would have more support. Um, and then also um, just opportunities to balance, have the work-life balance. I feel like you know that as a graduate student, especially coming in from your graduate assistantships, like we know like you work more than 40 hours. You know that you are, you know, you're gonna be in the work, but also like trying to move into your professional work, like having that balance and me coming out to California, I was like, okay, well, I'll be at work, but I'll have opportunities where I can like try to self-sustain. Um, but I think, and then also going back to um, is what Anne Marie and Gigi was talking about as well. Like I was super um, involved in undergrad and in my graduate experience. Um, so being um, a part of a sorority, being a student activist, working with a number of different higher level administrators to help get our voices heard. Um, so coming into higher ed uh, overall and into this position, like I had that expectation for myself um, that I will also help this help students get their voices heard on campus. Um, so really for me, having to navigate the student activism portion going into the pro uh, professional role was really hard um, and not truly having that support that I expected to have. Um, and it's, it's hard for me to talk about right now because I'm trying to, um, I'm actually in a place where I'm transitioning from the institution. Um, so really, really thinking about that and navigating and understanding like the balance between that. Um, I was talking to Gina earlier as far as ensuring and trying to, to self-sustain those mentorships, but also kind of go and navigate through a toxic space. Um, it's been hard for me, um, but really thinking about that. So like a specific example that I could provide for you all um, is that a group of students on campus wanted the Black Lives Matter flag to be raised up on campus. So helping them navigate that with higher level administrators. And um, I think at some point within the conversation, it was a us versus them, which it usually is. Um, and I began to be on the side with students. <laughs> so, um, well, I was pictured on being as on the side of students um, and trying to help and, and navigate them and um, push them forward into empowering their voices uh, was a hard line to fight. Um, and being the only person in my seat um, and helping students in a cross-cultural center uh, was hard to navigate. <laughs> um, so, but not having the support too was tough. So just 
I think my realities, it came into the reality, like I always talk about the California dream, uh, but it started going into reality that um, the support that I did have in those earlier experience of higher education of being a student may not translate into my role. Um, but moving forward into my next position, like how can I make that how can I make that a possibility? And also, how can I be uh, more strategic on how I um, empower student voices as well? So, hope that makes sense. <laughs> it does. Thank you, Jessica. <clears throat> um, to follow up on kind of some of a theme that I've heard a little bit, as you all have talked a little bit about the different um, paths that you have taken, is to go back to a question that um, Anne-Marie alluded to as well as giving that thought to, is student affairs really for you? Was there a point in your career that you thought about leaving student affairs, leaving higher ed, or doing something similar or a combination? Was there a point in time that you gave some consideration to um, leaving the profession or doing something different? I do want to start one. Yeah. Um, in my first job, I remembered, you know, being that new professional as Jessica, you kind of go through those struggles where you're trying to really find yourself and try to figure out what's happening. And at the same time, <laughs> there's a lot of political flames flying around on campus. And at the time, um, the boss who I really admired and um, respected, we had a change in leadership at the top of the vice president for enrollment services changed. And so we ended up getting someone who had no experience really in the field and was placed into the position and then somebody below her who was actually an hourly worker um, under my boss ended up becoming our boss and so we actually talked about it as kind of this dark thir it was called black thursday was the day that she was let go and so this other person who had just been a spousal hire on campus had just been an hourly worker as i mentioned in my job became our supervisor. And so that was really difficult because all of us had been training her in that position and now we all reported to her and then my former boss was now no longer even in the picture. And so that was a really difficult time. And I remembered having to rely on my mentors a lot during that period because it was one of those where, you know, you just struggled to come in every day and there was a point in time where I even thought maybe I could just get a part-time job at the mall. <laughs> and just work there or maybe figure out how to work two part-time jobs and turn it into a full-time job. And, you know, as many of you will probably experience soon after you had that first job where you have benefits and things like that and time paid time off, it's really hard to go backwards to just do, you know, some hourly job um, in retail. And so I had to sit down with one of my mentors who said, you know, you can't really leave this job without finding another job. So, you know, as hard as as difficult it was to stay in it, I just had to, you know, keep my head down, keep doing a really good job, and then really going back to focusing on why I wanted to do this work in the first place, and that knowing that some of these hurdles were just going to be, you know, part of the process, and having learning how to navigate those issues was was going to re require me to rely more on the people in my life, family, and also professional. Um, mentors that I had and that was really important in having to get over that hump and so when I finally found the next job you know I had applied for a number of jobs off campus and on campus and so being able to finally find a position on campus to move into was really um, really really uh, you know lifting that that burden off my shoulders so you know just kind of the you know having that grit to stay with <laughs> the issues that you're having and, you know, really rely on the people in your life who can support you through those difficult times, I think is really important. Thank you. I think Jessica had some thoughts on this. Yes. <laughs> um, I definitely agree with Gigi. Like you go through those moments continuously uh, when times get tough and you don't have that support. Um, but before, like after graduate school, I was also considering going into nonprofits. So like um, specific organizations like Posse Scholarship Foundation, which does a lot of access and retention um, for students and they provide um, scholastic funds for them as well. So thinking about that, I was also thinking about um, One Go, which is a Chicago nonprofit um, for access and retention for first gen, low income um, and my minoritized groups. Um, so I was 
I was playing with this for a little bit after graduate school, um, and I had a position to come to Cali, and then I also had a position in nonprofit. So I was <laughs> kind of wavering what uh, what do I want to do? Getting back to like as as Gigi talked about, like why did I come into the field? Um, asking myself those questions, and I think you. I think now after my year and a half of being in my position, um, I'm starting to answer that question and understanding like um, what I talked about in the first question is like, okay, where are all the black students at on campus and where are all the students of color on campus? Um, I can answer that in, in all different types of areas. So I've been expanding my thought process on what that looks like. Like, can I go into a nonprofit and still um, be passion focused with the work that I do and what I still feel sustained in that field? Um, and then also thinking about what Gigi said as far as I want to get closer to family. I'm out here in California, um, but I resigned from my position and I'm going to be moving back to Chicago uh, for that same reason, getting back to my family and my um, my village, as I would say. Uh, <laughs> to do some self-sustaining and they're also fine. Also fine, that's a, another area of passion for me, like giving back to my community, which is Chicago. Um, so I think thinking about your holistic self, when when these things come around, um, as far as like when you're questioning, having those questionable moments of like, oh, why did I get into the field? Always going back to that. And then thinking about the holistic needs, like financially, personally, how can you self-sustain? Um, it's super important to think about your whole self because we oftentimes, and student affairs, we're giving, we're giving, we're giving, um, and you can't give from an empty cup. <laughs> so understanding like your whole being and how can you put your, um, how can you make sure that your cup is being filled on a day to day, um, is super important. And I'll, I'll continue to talk more about it. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Anne Marie. Sure. Yeah. Um, and certainly, you know, I sort of echo what, what Gigi said in terms of, um, I think especially the, the longer that you're in the field, the more you need to start thinking about um, sort of how to leave. So as I indicated, when I left my first job, um, I was able to kind of just pick up, go back home, do some temp work um, while looking for another job. Um, when I left Loyola, I all of a sudden had a mortgage um, and some other things that um, made uh, things a little bit different in terms of um, exactly how to leave. Um, I think that it can be, depending on, um, you know, experiences in graduate school, I think, you know, um, I think for me, it was my first sort of peek behind the curtain to get a better understanding of how some things worked um, on the inside, if you will, um, different from my undergraduate kind of perspective. Um, and then, you know, certainly you kind of begin to form opinions about how things happen and, and how you would prefer that things are handled. And, um, you know, I think a lot of us enter into that first job, um, still pretty idealistic and um, with a lot of hopes for the institution and for ourselves um, and sometimes uh, we have a harder landing than others in terms of um, you know whether those expectations are met and so um, I think one of the things that I have thought about over the course of my career is um, what kinds of challenges am I prepared to deal with um, at either the types of institutions or at what distance from my family? So um, I think that as as we grow as professionals, we begin to kind of see what what are the things that are most important to me? What are the things that I can I can deal with and you know kind of struggle through? And what are those things that I really can't deal with and I really can't struggle through? Um, you know I've. Um, I've applied for jobs um, in certainly nonprofit um, organizations um, at the high school level. Um, as I was looking to leave Loyola, I, you know, for the first time ever was looking at corporate America, um, figured that, you know, in terms of training and development, certainly a lot of transferable skills coming over from higher ed and had a great kind of informational interview with someone who certainly said, yep, I see a lot of things here um, that would certainly translate well. well. We'll keep this on file and see sort of, you know, what happens as, as positions may open. So um, I've also been in those moments where every time I've got 
gotten frustrated, <laughs> I've sent off another resume to another job, um, only to have a few, you know, months later be contacted and say, yeah, thanks. Um, I think I'm going to stick around uh, where I am. And they said, yeah, we were a little curious as to why you were, you know, applying so quickly after starting a new position. Um, and so, you know, I think we all go through um, various um, experiences and, um, you know, I want to get out of here. And so I'm going to, I'm going to work to get out of here, but then realize maybe not so much. Maybe, maybe there is something for me here um, for me to kind of learn from and grow from. And certainly in my, my personal situation, I, I could not be happier that I decided to stick around. Um, so I think, you know, Part of the challenge. Uh, one thing I would say is don't be afraid to to kind of explore outside. I think we can also get in this mindset that um, the student affairs path is the only path that I can take, um, but it really isn't. There are a lot of um, great things and, and other positions out there that I think we bring a lot to um, as student affairs professionals, and so certainly had that echoed back from me for me in uh, in some of the interviewing and the uh, information gathering I was doing when I was looking to leave the field. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, just as a, a reminder, a little bit of housekeeping, that you can type in your questions um, in the chat box. So <clears throat> as you can type them along, and then I'll be able to see those, and we can pass those on to our um, facilitators. Um, I've heard a little bit today about um, mentoring or calling on mentors or having discussions with your mentors. Um, I, I do feel that one of the items that's left out there a little bit that I think helps our new professionals and our grad students stay in our profession is having access to and utilizing um, mentors. So in your opinion, given some thought to this, Talk to me, us a little bit about um, the importance of mentorship and how success and in <clears throat> how a good mentor relationship can help you be successful in your student affairs career. And then, how had would you suggest um, our professionals go about um, engaging professional uh, mentors, getting those mentors? Well, I'll jump in, Gina. I would say, you know, when I met my one of my first mentors is someone who actually introduced me to NASPA and this was 17 years ago um, at Arkansas and that was huge for me because I hadn't I didn't know of any professional organizations tied to the work that I was doing and at the time I was in enrollment services and so I had done some work with some of the regional admissions and enrollment groups but I really wanted to get involved in a student affairs organization and so meeting someone who was the dean of students on our campus at the time was really beneficial to me because he showed me you know you can go to the national conference the regional conference and i've been active in NASPA ever since that time and so i think that's really important to be able to connect with folks on campus i think the generation now is so different than how we have got into the field and so i think the biggest thing about mentorship for me is really find a develop a genuine interaction with someone you know my advice would not be to go out and just you know let me pick the vice chancellor for student affairs and i'm going to have lunch with her and ask her to be my mentor i mean i would say you know develop those relationships with someone first because if you go out in the first meeting you're asking them to be your mentor you might realize well, this is not really a good fit for me you know it doesn't have to be the person at the top all the time it could be somebody who's an assistant director or somebody who's a coordinator associate director whatever it doesn't always have to be you know the people on this senior leadership team at the institution because a lot of folks can provide that mentorship that you need but you i really feel like for me it's important to have a genuine connection with the people that you're looking for i mean i've met a lot of new professionals now who are really just looking to meet people for you know because of their title and not really because it's a good match for them and i think that those relationships tend to not last and so i think it's really important to make sure when you're looking at mentors find someone who has a similar career path or that you're looking toward that you can really glean from and not so much focus on their title yeah and i'll i'll jump in for a quick second and just say um to anyone who may feel like, oh my gosh, I don't have a mentor. What what do I what do I do now? Um, I would say, uh, don't panic. Um, I uh, I would I would articulate that I 
I don't really have a mentor. Um, part of it, I think, may be uh, because of the weight that I imbue that particular term with. Um, part of it, I maybe I'm just a loner, um, but I, um, you know, certainly have worked with and for some amazing people over the course of my life. And I would say that probably I'll use the, the term as a verb instead of a noun. I have been mentored at different parts of my, points in my career. Um, folks have offered me their wisdom, their support, their advice, um, you know, their ears uh, at, at different points. And so um, I think more and more, I certainly hear folks talking about specific mentors um, who have been maybe in a person's life for many, many years, someone they continue to um, reach back to and, um, and engage at different points in their career. Um, and I admire that. I think that's outstanding. Um, I, I, I can't speak to that particular kind of professional mentor experience. Um, I certainly have been mentored at different times in different ways um, by friends, by professionals, by um, all kinds of folks. And so, um, you know, I think there was a time where I started to get nervous. Oh my gosh, what's the matter? I don't have a mentor. What am I going to do? How am I going to manage this? Um, but I think you can um, also shift your perspective and certainly think about the folks who have kind of offered that to you um, in different ways um, and not necessarily a single person or, or a handful of, of people. So, um, so if you're like me and you get nervous, like, oh my gosh, I don't have one. What do I do now? Um, just know that you may not have one now, but you very well may have one later, or you may have people who mentor you at different periods in your life. Um, and it just looks a little different. Yeah, I agree. Um, thinking about mentorship, too, is I was telling Gina, I was like, she's like, why haven't you called me? And I'm like, I've just been going through, Gina. <laughs> so <laughs> having mentors that can um, be that can be in your different areas of life. So um, I have a spiritual mentor, somebody I could talk to about like my spiritual holistic being. Um, I have um, mentors that's in the field. I have several mentors that's in the field, but um, thinking about my past year and the things that I needed, like I haven't been as connected as I needed to be, but something that helped me was going to NASPA and making, making it a point to see my mentors. Like I wasn't just trying to go and like be with friends and hang out. Um, I met up with my mentors, um, had lunch or whether it was just like they were eating at this place, I would just stop and discuss about like things that been happening in my year. And then also it's important to know that Sometimes mentorship, we kind of think of it as a one-way street, but thinking of it as a, a reciprocation, like um, a, a mutual beneficial relationship, I believe, and very genuine in that aspect too. So if my mentor needs, um, specifically like at the University of Illinois, all my mentors know like, oh, you can call me if you need something. And I feel that I can do the same too. Um, so making sure that um, it's all, like we're a village, we're all working together. I think of my, mentors and people that help guide me as my village, as my rocks, um, and not only calling to them when things are horrible, but also calling on them to get updates, to ask them how they're doing um, is super important as well. But keeping in contact, I think something coming from a millennial, and I'm going to kind of just generalize us a little <laughs> bit. Um, we think that we're connected sometimes, but <laughs> sometimes we're not. And uh, we have to be very clear with our mentorship relationships on what we want um, and how can we sustain those <clears throat> um, and with our mentors. So, Okay, I'm going to take a moment here to, as we prepare to wind down, to go check our... <laughs> See if anyone's asking a question. <clears throat> and I'm not seeing any. Maybe not. Maybe not. Which is okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, um, as we prepare to wrap up um, here, um, I would like for each of you to, to reflect on a, a final question, um, which is what is the one piece of advice you would share 
um, with our new professionals and graduate students in this particular knowledge community about is this the right field for you? Sure, I'll I'll jump in real fast on that. Um, when you pose that question, um, I was instantly transported back to uh, North Dakota State University um, when we brought the late uh, Dr. Will Keim uh, to campus to to speak to uh, various populations of our students, including uh, student affairs professionals. And I remember him saying something along the lines of, um, and and I'm gonna. I'm going to mess this up a lot, so um, Dr. Kime, forgive me. Um, but um, something along the lines of uh, our students deserve, um, I think, our full attention and our full sort of commitment. And so at that point where we start getting probably more bitter than not, um, it's time for us to really to think about leaving. Um, and um, I've, I've come back to that at various points in my life um, and in my career. Um, you know, I've had um, sort of colleagues, you know, say to me, um, you need to think about what you need to be able to kind of pick yourself back up and move forward um, or or not, um, given just sort of maybe the struggles that I was dealing with, either personally or professionally. Um, and so I think that, you know, especially when we think about, um, I'll echo something that Gigi said um, a little bit earlier too, like the landscape of higher education, this is not the same field that I entered 20 some years ago. Um, it just isn't. Um, and I think about that a lot. And I think the number of students and the kinds of things that they're dealing with, um, both kind of personally and in our world, are so different um, and require certainly um, a lot from us. And while I, I don't believe that we need to donate our whole lives and our whole selves to our jobs, um, I do know that it, it takes a great deal from us um, and that we need to be well and prepared to, to give what we need to give in order to, to truly, I think, um, be of service to others in this role. And so I, I come back every now and again to Dr. Kimes' words um, and really think about, um, am I truly doing justice to our, to our students? Um, and so I would just throw that out there. Um, as soon as you start realizing it's, you have more days than that of having a hard time getting out of bed. You have more days than that when you come in sort of bitter and upset um, about things that are happening. Um, what does that mean? What does that tell you? And, and might it be telling you it's time to, to try a different path? You can always come back, perhaps down the road, um, but but that his words continue to stick with me. Yeah, excellent piece of advice, Anne Marie. Oh, that was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, what about you? I think for me, um, just I. I I think Anne Marie said greatly, like just thinking about who you are. I'm, I really talk about this all the time, like your holistic self, like that's super important. Like for me coming out to California, um, I wish I would have intentionally thought about more, like what would that mean? Move Hello, Jessica. Okay. We'll see. We have technology. There you are. We can. There you are. Oh, y'all can hear me now. I can hear you now. Oh, okay. So I was talking about being an activist going into the professional role, like balancing that, um, having more conversations about what your mentors about what does that mean? Um, and how can you advocate for student voices um, clearly and not let um, the, po the politics get in the way of what you want to accomplish? Um, and then also when you're on the job search, really asking, being clear about what support means for you as a new professional um, to translate that into um, when you have an on campus, asking those critical questions as far as like, for me being a black woman, um, support, like having that support may look differently for someone else. Um, so me having to articulate what is that, what does that need? What does that need and how can I 
help my future supervisor understand that need. So it's super important for you to artic articulate um, what do you need coming into this role. We say support a lot, but um, you need to be specific when you are um, searching for jobs and having that on campus um, and really thinking about your full self coming into a position because we do give a lot to um, higher education and to our students, but you need to be in a space where you can get filled as well. Thanks, Jessica. <clears throat> Um, I would say, you know, just make sure to get involved in the national organizations, um, whether it's NASPA or ACPA, I think that's extremely important. We've had a number of grad students who participate at the regional level and they eventually get on national planning committees for national conferences. And so I think that's really important to make sure that you're, you say professionally connected. I think that's really important to kind of expand your network and then continue to build that network of professionals that you can rely on for your, for your work. And again, I'm going to check the chat box one final time. <laughs> See if anyone had a question. Well, seeing none, um, our time um, is up. Um, again, I want to thank our speakers today for joining us, um, Dr. Gigi Sakuban, Jessica thank Newman, and Anne Marie Morgan. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with the members of our knowledge community. Um, we certainly do appreciate the time that you have um, given um, as well. Um, to close, I want to again mention that the masterclass um, that we offer are ways to engage the knowledge community, but also to kind of help support each member in their growth and development as they're moving along in their um, new careers um, as new professionals or still as um, graduate students. Um, again, in our next master class, the focus of that master class is all around the career path and how to navigate that career path. And as a reminder, as I started off with, to if you're making it to the regional conference in Detroit, uh, please check us out um, for our knowledge community social on the 13th of November at 6 p.m. at the Hard Rock Cafe. Um, again, thank you to our guest speakers today. We appreciate your time. Thank you all for joining us today. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye.